all the plans that I wanted to do crystallized in my head. I knew what I was gonna do. I was gonna go into the, either the school and attack the school food court, or I was going to go to the mall and attack the mall food court. So I was waiting three days to get the gun. And I went to Mike at the end of that three days. And when I knocked on his door, I was in tears. He brought me inside and he sat me down and gave me some food, gave me a shower, and he kept on telling me, you're a good kid in a shit world. What he really did was he put the tiny granular bits of humanity back on the bottom shelf of my life. This episode of What's Underneath Masculinity is made possible with the support of BetterHelp. If you want to start therapy, give BetterHelp a try and head to betterhelp.com slash what's underneath for 10% off your first month. So can you begin by talking about how you feel right now? I feel nervous and excited. I've found a lot of power in being vulnerable with what I've been doing. The first time I did open up about my own life and my history and my, all the pain I went through growing up, it was like a giant weight jumped off my chest. It's been quite the journey, and I think that this is a great next step. Mm -hmm. We're honored that you're taking it with us. Thank, Thank you. you. Can you talk about what your style says about you? I like to be as normal and everyday as possible. My bandana is really important to me because I have a trans son. It's been a really important thing in our, in our family to be accepting and honest and truthful. For my kid to know he's not a crime. <laughs> like currently there's a lot of, of anti-trans and anti-gay hate going around and he's been hit with some of it. And we do our best to make sure we tell him he's all right. Mm -hmm. Can you talk a little bit about the assumptions that people make about you based on how you look? If you look at me just cold, you might think that I am some angry metalhead or, hey dude, what, what you doing over there kind of guy. I think that people don't assume that I'm as smart as I am and possibly that I'm more capable in other areas than I actually am. I, I work at a gas station in Denver. And so I get a lot of conversations with people when they're coming up to me that'll be like, hey, so I got this F-150 out there, man. It's got all these, these things and, all, and I'm like, dude, I am auto illiterate. I have no idea what you just said to me. It's the same thing with sports. People will come up like, oh, did you see the college game and all this? I'm like, yeah, I, I don't know, I, I don't know. But you wanna hear a cool fact about the Big Bang? I'm a big science nut. So whenever I feel like I'm getting judged as like, oh yeah, sure, yeah, you don't know. You're just some big hairy dude. Like I'll like, okay, well, do you know what a five-dimensional hypercube is? Because if you take the four dimensions of space and, and you have, <laughs> like, I'll totally break down a physics concept. I don't think I have the ability in me to get embarrassed or ashamed about anything. I, I just, I think I burned it out when I was a kid. I spent my life insulting myself more than anybody else around me. And if you told me how terrible I was, then it wasn't anything close to how terrible I would say I was afterwards. I spent my life knowing I was a monster and that I was broken. And after I got out of that, I still knew in my heart that something with me was broken and wrong. I was bad. And even if people told me I was good, then they just didn't know all of me because if they found out all of me, they'd hate me. And then that completely changed when they found out all of me. In 2018, when Parkland happened, the day after we were watching the, the news and my wife and my daughter were having a big tearful discussion about how could that ever happen? How could someone ever do this? And at the same time I'm watching the news and I see the reporter interviewing this girl that has like blood splattered on her shirt. And the reporter's asking her a question, how did that make you feel? I'm like, what kind of stupid question is that? And so it made me mad. And I went to the toilet and wrote a Facebook post as we all do. And when I did, that was the first moment where I said I was almost a school shooter. By the time I left the bathroom, my wife and my daughter had read the Facebook post and my wife knew about 60% of my history. My daughter knew about 20% of my history, but they didn't know any about anything about this. And so I just opened up and let them ask any question they could think of, dig as deep as possible. I'm gonna answer everything completely truthfully. The very next day, they had a camera crew come to my house to have me to film me reading that Facebook post. That got 17 million views in a week. And I went instantly from thinking it was a dark spot in my life. If anybody ever found out about it, they'd hate me and, and it, I would get attacked to getting hit with responses from all over the planet. I got a message from the survivors at Columbine. They said, please keep going. I got a message from the kids down in Parkland that had seen my story and they said, please keep going. And that's what really made me decide, okay, 
I have this pivot point here. I can either stop or I can go. And I decided to go. And that made, meant that I had to drop everything of my past. I had to let go of all of the shell that I had before and realize that it was just a shell, that it was that old blanket of darkness that I had that was now tight and nasty and dirty and broken and ripped apart because it wasn't fitting anymore. And I needed to take it off. I needed to, to rip off the old me and step into who I was. Can you talk about why you felt you were a monster? Like, why, like where, what, what, was, what was the origins of all that? Like, where did that begin? I started life in a really, really dark place. My birth father was the most violent, depraved person I've ever met. The abuse, the rapes, the beatings, the attacks that we suffered from my birth father were the kind of stuff that they make horror movies about. My mom at the time was more like Linda Hamilton from T2. Like she was like the survivalist to the point where we had survival words. If the word pocket came out of her mouth, that meant we were to grab the back pocket of her pants and we need to get out right now. When she finally escaped my father, she sent me and my brother up to Oregon. Up in Oregon, they sent us to live with my pedophile uncle. And so when we finally escaped that again, and when my mom moved us back to Colorado, she was with my stepdad by that point. And it went from Stephen King movie to like Scarface. It went from like a horror movie to drugs and crime. And I'm like nine, 10 years old. And that's the, just the house we're living in. We were very nomadic. We were, I never was in a school longer than six months my entire life. I moved back and forth constantly, usually from Oregon to Colorado, as my parents were either evicted or the cops tried to show up or social workers investigated. And I would always be getting picked on because I didn't have clean clothes and I was dirty and I was smelly and, and, and I would show up to school filthy to the point where I even went to school one day and had crapped my pants on the walk to school and went to school the whole day with poop filled pants. And the next day I went to school and the teacher had brought in a box of stuff like pants and school supplies and a coat and all these new things for me and like a box of stuff for me. And I come home and I'm really excited like, hey, check this out. And the very next day we were gone. That means that the social teachers are looking too close. Someone's investigating too much and we need to get out before, before problems hit. So they, they just took that as a signal they need to get out. And so that really taught me early on that reaching out for help was dangerous. Because if I reach out for help, if I try to get some kind of support, then I'm going to go to foster care, my brother's going to go to foster care, my mom's going to go to jail, my stepdad's going to go to jail, because I tried to get help. When I was about 12 years old, I met the only good part of my life at that time, a kid named Mike. We bonded instantly over comic books and deep conversation. And he became like my home base. I was there all the time. I'd go spend weeks there. I would be there even when he was at school. I would skip school and go to his house. Would your mom be looking for you when you were like out for weeks? Uh -uh. No. No, she didn't care. I never once had my mom come to try to find me. I never once had her come search me out. She never went to the school to go check, to go have a meeting with the school about where I was at. None of that. And what would drive you to then ever go back home if you were like kind of mostly not there? It was where all my stuff was and I would occasionally go back there to refill and try to get some food or try to, to get something. And it, without a doubt, every single time I would go there, I'd end up with a giant screaming, coked out fight or a giant argument and never ended up good. When I was about 14 years old, I left home. I couldn't take it anymore with all the drugs and the fighting and the chaos and I went homeless. At the same time, I developed a, a group of there weren't friends, but looking back, I call them disaster groupies. They were kids who kind of wanted to live vicariously through my darkness and see how far into the dark I could go. Instead of talking about girls or sports or movies, we talk about killing people. Looking back, it was a bunch of depressed kids navigating that kind of emotion without any kind of adult supervision or any kind of rudder for what to do. Um, but they all got to go to their houses, and I got to go to the field behind Casa Bonita. I had burned out Mike's house. I got, his parents got so sick of me that I couldn't be at his house anymore because I was so dirty. So they didn't want me to spend the night at his house anymore. So I'm quickly burning through all of those resources. And I also started self-harming right about that same time. I started cutting. And shortly after that, within like a week of that, I'm in Mike's tool shed, which ended up being kind of like my last spot home base, the last refuge. If I didn't have anywhere else I could sleep, if I was absolutely homeless for the night, 
I could go to Mike's tool shed and sleep in there. So I'm in there one night and I'm cutting myself so bad and I think I gotta do something or I'm gonna, get, I'm gonna die. And I called social services on myself and I set an appointment for later that day. And when I get there, they actually had called my mom and brought her in too. And they say, okay, what's the problem? What are we here for? And I bring out a bloody razor blade, square box cutter style razor blade, throw it on the table. I say, that's what we're here for. And my mom gets him to believe that I was just making it all up, that I was just doing it for attention, that I did it all the time, I was just doing it for a rise, that, that it's not that serious, that it's all just superficial and she can take care of it. And they sent me home with her. And we get like three blocks away from the place and she turns to me and she snarls, next time you should do a better job and I'll buy you the fucking razor blades. I'm like, okay, you want me to be a monster? I'll show you what a monster is now. I purposefully went and tried to burn down every bit of good in my life. If you were nice to me, I was gonna figure out what offended you and do that specific thing. I was consciously trying to break everything good in my world. After nine months of that, of solid personal destruction, of being toxic as possible to everybody, I mean like outlandishly toxic, like offensive in every way possible, making the worst offensive comments you can think of, I am now alone and I'm in the field behind Casa Bonita. I was surviving off of stealing food from the grocery store next to Casa Bonita and um, free samples from there. I woke up one morning and it was snowing. I wasn't just shaking, I was seizing. I was like, could barely breathe. Like my whole body was just shaking like crazy. And across the street from the school I was at, there was a building that said mental health. They had me meet a young lady. She was in her early 20s. And I don't really remember much about that conversation because all I remember is the very end when she said, I'm sorry, there's nothing I can do, I can't help you. And when I walked out of that door, my brain snapped like a mirror. And that's the spot where everything just broke. And right there, all the plans that I wanted to do crystallized in my head. I knew what I was gonna do. I was gonna go into the, either the school and attack the school food court, or I was going to go to the mall and attack the mall food court. The school had uniformed armed police officers in it at all times and the mall had a police station like three doors down from the food court. The goal was suicide by cop. I was gonna kill a lot of people and then die in the action. And what's important to note is neither one of those were actually my target. That was the damage that I was going to cause, but the target was actually my parents. I wanted to make my parents deal with creating me. I wanted to make them deal with having a monster. So I was waiting three days to get the gun. And in that three day time, I didn't think about it at the time, but looking back, I think I was saying goodbye. I was going to people that I cared about in a much more calm way and saying thank you for keeping me alive and doing stuff like giving away all my comic books. And I went to Mike at the end of that three days. And when I knocked on his door, I was in tears. And when he answered, he didn't ask me what was wrong. He brought me inside and he sat me down and gave me some food, gave me a shower, and he kept on telling me, you're a good kid in a shit world. What he really did was he put the tiny granular bits of humanity back on the bottom shelf of my life. It was like a, the waves were about to break and crash over everything, and when he did that, it like pushed the water back, and I was able to instead of sloshing back and forth in that tsunami, I was finally able to put my feet on the ground and like breathe for the first time in years. He saw you. He saw me. He, he, and to be seen at a time when I didn't even feel invisible, I felt erased. Like I felt like a void because everybody else in my life looked, to me, I was, looked at me like I was a project or a monster. And Mike never saw me as that, ever. Never once, we've been friends now. I'm 44 years old, so 32 years. He's never once judged me for any of this life that I've had and continually tried to get me help, continually tried to, to, in his own way, try to help me without making it seem like I was a project that he wanted to fix. It was like resetting the clock on my humanity. We know you're really gripped by the story you're hearing, but we just wanted to interrupt this episode very quickly to tell you a little bit about our incredible sponsor, BetterHelp. Hey mom, how do you feel about therapy? Uh, therapy has literally saved my life. How? It has been absolutely one 100% life-defining in terms of being able to be 
in touch with your true self, healing your old and deep wounds that might be running your life and feeling your feelings, but then understanding underneath it all that you're this vibrant whole person that just in many ways is functioning from blind spots or things that you don't see. And then once you see them, you become free. If you're thinking of starting therapy, we really recommend that you give BetterHelp a try. BetterHelp is entirely online and it's designed to be very convenient and flexible to suit your schedule. All you have to do is just fill out a brief questionnaire and you'll be matched with a licensed therapist that meets your needs. And if for any reason you're not satisfied or you want to switch therapists, you can do so for no extra charge at any time. Visit betterhelp.com slash what's underneath for 10% off your first month. That's better H E L P dot com slash what's underneath for 10% off your first month. And now back to the episode. I never went and got the gun. And it's important to note that it's not like it was a light switch that flipped. It wasn't like, ding, everything's better. Like, no. The hell of my family was still the same. The chaos at home was still the same. Now, that was when I was in between the age of 16 and 17. Okay, now we're gonna fast forward two years. Night of my 19th birthday, I'm planning on committing suicide. But the day of my 19th birthday, I was trying to act like nothing was wrong. So I went to Mike's house. And so Mike is a very social person himself. He has a social circle of his own. And in this social circle, there's a girl named Amber, okay? And Amber was always really nice to me. She was really friendly to me. And so he's like, hey, we're gonna kick it at Amber's today. Right on, that's a great last day. And we'll spend it with two of my favorite people and then go to, back to the field and end my life. And we get to Amber's house and that wasn't it at all. It was actually a surprise birthday party for me. And I walked into a room full of about 14 people saying happy birthday. And they had baked me a blueberry peach pie, and I walked past him and dropped my drugs in the toilet, and that was the last time I ever tried to kill myself. And Amber's also one of my best friends of this day. We just saw a concert just a month and a half ago. So. If you notice what I'm talking about, I don't cry when I'm talking about the pain. I don't cry when I'm talking about the abuse. I don't cry when I'm talking about my father or my or mom or any of that stuff. I cry when I talk about Mike saving my life. Because that, my, between Mike and my kids and my wife, those are the three parts of my life that saved me completely. That's the part I'm most thankful for, and I will do anything to keep and do anything to make proud. And I never thought I could make anybody proud. So the fact that I, I'm able to at all means that I, I, I should keep going. Can you talk a little bit about like your healing and recovery? Well, shortly after that birthday party, I had the very first step in my full recovery process. Mm -hmm. And that's a thing I call acknowledgement, where I went to all the different abusers in my life, I went to my mom, my stepdad, my grandparents, my uncle, like everybody that hurt me in my life, and told them exactly how I felt. And it was really important to not do it in an accusatory, retaliatory way. I didn't ever do it saying, you hurt me and you need to pay. It was always, our relationship has fundamentally changed, I actually don't love you, and I'm done. And I walked away. So one of the best things in my life these days is I never sit and think, man, if they could only knew how I felt. They all know. The next step in my recovery was the birth of my first child. That finally gave me something outside of me that I could love and that, I, that mattered and gave me a goal. And the goal was give that kid a life that's not mine. And so I, I purposefully took my, what happened to me in the parenting that I had growing up and used that as an example of how to parent my children. I just do the opposite. So I tell my kids I love them so much it's annoying. I'm at every game, I'm at every show, every, every sporting thing, I'm at all the different class things because that's, to me, that's really, really important. The personal power that I've gotten from being able to talk about my truth, it's mind blowing and weird and exhilarating and powerful all at the same time. But that's part of the catharsis. That's part of the journey of going through it. You can't go around the problem, you can't go over it, you can't go, you can't go under it, you have to go through it. But when you go through it, you will get to the other side. Treat that kid in the dark that thinks, that tells himself that he hates himself constantly and tells himself that, he, that everything in his life is bad and he's the fault of it. Tell him that he's wrong. And I try to use that, try to help someone else not have to go down that path. And to see if they are, that they're not alone. When you're in the worst of the worst prison and you do something wrong, they put you in solitary. We punish our worst killers with being alone. And if that's what your life is, then that's what we need to fix. When do you feel the most vulnerable? That's a strange question because I kind of don't. 
I both do feel really vulnerable and open, but also not vulnerable in the sense that I'm not in danger of being attacked because of it. Vulnerability in my mind implies that there's a, a, a sense of it that can mean that, that I'm in danger of being hurt. I, I feel exhilarated in being vulnerable in the sense that I'm exposing myself to the possibility of that, but I'm also not afraid of that possibility anymore. I'm no longer scared of being vulnerable and I'm no longer scared of having anybody judge or throw slings and arrows at me. Because today, I'm really happy with me and I just have reached a state of being comfortable with being vulnerable and open. And last question, what does it mean to you to be man enough? To me, the words man enough means to own all the responsibility and accountability for every decision that you've made. To not throw that responsibility off onto somebody else. To realize the potential damage and potential good that you can do to everybody around you. That if you decide that you're going to be toxic, then you will breed toxicity. But if you decide you're gonna be good, then you can breed goodness as well. And to me, that's being man enough. Stepping up and realizing that that fake macho bullshit is what causes men to lash out in self-hatred. Being man enough is being comfortable in yourself and realizing that when you woke up today, you were good enough. And it's okay to fail. And it's okay to cry. And it's okay to be vulnerable. And it's okay to let someone know that you love them. And it's okay to let someone know that you're hurt. And it's okay to reach out for help. My experience is my experience. And it's not the same for every school shooter. It's not the same for every kid who's gone through that dark. There's a very small sliver of people that are gonna follow through with those attacks. Very small amount. But there's a giant gray area of people that think they could, should, or might. By talking about my life, if I can help even one person not turn into me, then I'm gonna keep talking until I don't have a voice. How do you feel right now? Good. Empowered. I don't feel vulnerable. I feel like I'm normal. Yeah, I, I feel a lot less nervous about being naked in front of you guys than I anticipated. Well, I didn't even realize I was gonna get naked until day before yesterday. So, <laughs> you guys sent me the video to watch and I didn't bother to watch the whole video. I watched the beginning of it with Janelle Monae. I'm like, oh, I like her, that's cool. I, did, I remember that video, that's really fun. But I didn't watch the rest of it. And so when I got the email listing about what I need for this, they're like, okay, make sure you have layers, make sure you have all this stuff. And by the way, make sure your underwear is presentable. I'm like, underwear? Underwear? Oh, that's what I'm doing. All right then. <laughs>